Good evening, everyone, and we're back with another episode of Up the Dale. Uh, we have made some promises that we were going to change up the content and uh, get some some people from different walks of cricketing life, and uh, and we've we've managed to do it again. Joining me as usual is is Dave Maguire, my co-host. Good evening, Dave. Evening, Neil. And uh, the gentleman joining us tonight is a familiar face to most. Uh, Mr. Martin Saggers, current international umpire and ex-England and Kent county cricketer. Good evening, Martin. Good evening, guys, and uh, good evening to everyone uh, watching. Evening. Thanks very much for joining us. As I say, we uh, we had Dan Norcross on last time, a bit of commentating insight, and uh, and we were just really grateful when you agreed to come on, because certainly from your umpiring perspective, and obviously the links that you've got with playing <coughs> as well, it's a, it's a really interesting perspective to look at. So, uh, again, thanks very much for joining us from that point of view. Not a problem at all. No, nice, nice to be able to uh, to, to to give you some of my uh, feedback of my life, I suppose. Well, on that note, we we call him our Jeremy Paxman. We'll hand you over to Dave. He's going to kick kick things off with uh, some some interesting questions and uh, into your into your cricketing background, Martin. So, Dave, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Neil. I'm not sure where I've got this reputation from. It seems to be just how, how you see it. But anyway, nice easy one to start with, Martin. Right back at the start of um, your cricketing journey. Um, how did you get into the game? You know, your sort of your junior cricket experience and, and things like that, and your, your earliest cricketing memories. Can you remember that? Yeah, well, um, when I was at school, um, I literally played every single sport there was. Um, I was the one nicknamed Sport Billy. Uh, from the comic strip at, at, at school. Um, so I obviously played a lot of football, and then when the summer came along, we played a lot of cricket. But um, it wasn't until I was 16 that um, I thought, you know, I want to play a bit more cricket. And there was an advert in the local paper looking for local cricketers. So it literally just said, um, looking for local cricketers, come along to the nets Thursday night um, and come and join in six o'clock. So I got my mum and dad to drop me off at six o'clock and um, turned up and the guy said, oh, what are you here for? I said, oh, the cricket, the nets. And he says, uh, well, we were looking for guys, you know, in their 20s to come and play for the sort of first team, second team. Um, but stick around, you know, you know, enjoy yourself and we'll get you in touch with the, uh, the under 16s, the youth side. Oh, great. You know, I just wanted to get involved. So 20 minutes later, the guy came back to me and he said, uh, um, slight change of plan just wondering what you're doing Saturday we want you to play for the seconds so it was sort of from from that from that first sort of moment of just I just wanted to play cricket and so it was a bit nerve-wracking to go into a, a you know literally a village side second team but it, it was just a great great time you know you're young you just want to get out there and play cricket so that's probably my earliest memory I suppose at that age you know no fear and you know just just you know, you just get on with it, I suppose, and no sort of experience. But the thing is, I hadn't played any cricket at all. Not even at school cricket. We literally just played during PE. Uh, there was a, there was a, it was the time when there was all the teachers' strikes, so they didn't have any cricket played on a Saturday or in the evening after school. It was just literally, um, you know, just play during PE. Um, but I, I just loved the game and wanted to play a bit more of it. Hence, you know, I went followed up on the newspaper articles. I've got to say that's that's an incredibly late start, Martin. Yeah. For if if you excuse me, blowing your own trumpet for you, somebody who went on to get achieve what you did, you know, sixteen really. I mean, I, up here in Lancashire, we're constantly told that Jimmy didn't get selected for eight, county age group squads until he was, I think, under fifteen, under sixteen. Um, but that sixteen, that's an incredibly late start for someone. Yeah, and I think I mean that that was a, a common factor within my sort of career. And it's, it's one thing that I think young cricketers shouldn't be worried about. Yeah. Um, I've, I've got a 15-year-old son who's sort of going through, he's literally, he's, he's, he's got so tall in the last year. He's actually now six foot two already. He's the same height as me. Um, and he's got an issue with his back. Yeah. And the last thing I want him to do is carry on bowling throughout the, the time that he's growing and his body's still not strong enough to hold his action. So I've said to him, you're not bowling at the moment at all. Mm. Knowing the experiences I've had of getting into the game late, I think it's important to make sure that your body's capable of 
bowling before you, you push yourself too far. So if it means he misses next summer as well, it doesn't bother me. I think you've just got to make sure your body's ready for it. Yeah. I mean, do you think there's sort of too much, kids are bowling too much at, at that sort of age between, say, 13 and 16? Are, are they doing too much? Should it be more sort of more a more rounded experience you know possibly playing other sports rather than just focusing and concentrating on one thing for example in, in like a, a, a cricket academy should they be getting out there and, and trying other things as well do you think well it's it's certainly something i mean yeah you, you've got to play all sports um because you never know if, if cricket doesn't appeal to you in, your, in a few years time mm. um i i encourage my, my son to go and play table tennis because it's good hand-eye coordination yeah. you know you've got to be quick and sharp and that's only going to help your your skills as more of a batter, more as a batter than a bowler. But um, you know, it's it, it is tough at that, at that age. You don't want to be stressing yourself. You just got to enjoy it. You don't yeah. want to be stressing yourself about wanting to become a professional at that age because you know you, you've just got to enjoy the game and you'll you'll learn a lot quicker and develop a lot quicker when you're just more relaxed. Yeah, and it will just come more naturally to you. Definitely. Um, so going back to your when you were that age, um, who were your first cricketing heroes at the time? Was there any any particular bowler, for example, you idolised, or was it as you say, you know, it was sort of? Uh... Well, we I used to um, I used to have a friend who had a decent sized garden, and now uh, we used to he, he had three brothers as well, so we used to have little mini matches together, and we always used to do impressions, you know, Phil De Freitas and people like that. But the one that I used to love was Malcolm Marshall. Um, yeah. For me, because I was an away swing bowler, it was something that just appealed to me. And just watching him bowl those away swingers, I mean, for all the West Indians, they're all six foot six, you know, and bowled bouncers. Apart from Marshall, yes, he could bowl a bouncer, but he just, he was just so skillful. And I think that's another thing that you've got to hone in on the, you know, the youngsters of today. They don't have to be 90, 95, 100 mile an hour. Yeah. As long as you're somebody who's got the skills, can get the ball in the same place all the time. Somebody like a Glenn McGrath or a Sean Pollock, um, they've got hundreds of test wickets and they've, they've done that because they're skillful bowlers. So that was what I looked at because I knew I was never a fast bowler, but I just had that ability to get it in the right place. And, and just, just to see that ball swing away was just, you know, a, a nice, nice sight to see. Mm. Definitely. Do you think there's perhaps too much focus at the minute on out and out pace compared to these other skills, as you say, um, consistency and, and, and swing and, and things like that? Is, is, has that been lost in the game? No, well, I think I think it's come back a lot, especially with obviously somebody like Jimmy. I mean, you don't get 600 wickets for, 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 for getting lucky. He is such a skillful bowler. And I've had many a conversation with him about, you know, just his wrist position, how he holds the ball, subtle little changes, you know, in his grip with his fingers and, you know, with his wrist, just, just the angle in which he's just releasing the delivery. Um, I think there was, a, there was a massive era in the sort of early noughties where um, Duncan Fletcher did want a lot of pace. Um, and uh, they wanted those 90 mile an hour bowlers, you know, reverse swing was massive in that that sort of period. So they wanted the bowlers that could bowl 90 mile an hour and reverse swing it. Um, yes, we, we won the Ashes with it as well, with, with Simon Jones, you know, Harmison, you know, very quick bowlers. But then you still had Hoggard yeah. Um, yeah. at the other end, who was still able to get the wickets with skillful bowling. Um, but I think nowadays, you know, there's a lot more, even the fast bowlers, they have to have the subtle changes in, um, you don't have to have one slow ball, you need two or three slower balls. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because the batsmen pick it so well nowadays. Yeah. Um, so if we just go back to, you said, you know, you, you, you suddenly, you know, what on the basis of one training session end up in, in the second team um, <laughs> club, club cricket, which I'm very jealous about, somebody being that naturally talented at the game. Um, I, 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 mine was very much, my journey was very much not like that and still it's into this day. Um, <laughs> Your memories of club cricket during that time, any memorable performances or games that you played in that you can, that you can share with us? Um, I think just the whole um, village cricket, because that, that's what it was. I played two years of village cricket, just travelling to 
picturesque grounds here and there around the Norfolk sort of um, countryside. Playing at um, Sandringham, you know, where the Queen yeah. goes for Christmas, there's a ground, there's a cricket ground within the grounds. And that was just one of our fixtures that we played every year. <laughs> you know, and it, it literally slopes here, there, and every mole hills on the, on the outfield. And it, you know, a, a, a pitch that was nowhere near flat. You just got on with it. You just played yeah. cricket. And I suppose the memory for me was, you know, we always used to meet at the, the ship pub um, in the car park. A few of them might have just popped in there for a couple of um, <laughs> pints beforehand, um, which, which you did. And then you go and play a social game of cricket. Yeah. You then socialise with the team at the end of the day. And, and you just have a great day. It's... it's Yes, you're competitive on the field, but it's at the end of the day, it's not about winning and losing. It's it's just having good banter with your mates and just having a good bit of fun. And I think that's that's where my real first memories come from those first two years. Do you think that's missing in the professional game when you were playing, or or, or currently <laughs> that, that sort of maybe not? It wasn't missing when I was missing. <laughs> Not missing when I was playing. <laughs> <laughs> do you think? Do you think that's missing um, perhaps nowadays? That that not maybe not the the you know going to the pub and things, but that that sort of camaraderie and that social aspect. No, I don't think it is. I, I think it's definitely still there. Um, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about it. But the uh, the bubble that we've been in, all the players, mm -hmm. they're, they're still obviously social distancing, but they're still having drinks together and they're still chatting because with with the introduction of all these new 2020 leagues. Yes, they're playing against each other for their countries, but for their, 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 their not county sides, but the, you know, all the, um, the 2020 sides they play for, they're playing with each other. So they, yeah. they know each other. Yeah. So when they're, when they're on the field, Australia versus England, they know each other inside out in their games and they can have a bit of banter on the field. Um, and and they they still do that, which is I mean I, I still have banter with the players as well myself, which which keeps you through going through the day and keeps you sane and and makes 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 them show that you, you're human, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, so if we move on, sort of in 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 your your journey, so to speak, and we go to 1996, and you start out with Durham. How how did a move like that come about to a, to a professional team? Yeah, well, it, well, it all started with, I finished my village sort of playing career, as it were, at 18, went to university um, in Huddersfield um, to study architecture. First thing I wanted to do was go and, at the Freshers' Fair, at Freshers' Week, go and join the cricket club, which I did. So during the winter, I was, I was just bowling in the nets, and this guy came up to me, who was running the team, he said, have you ever thought about playing professionally? I said, no, because I've come from Norfolk where there was no first-class cricket. The nearest yeah. one was either North Hans or Essex or, you know, it was a good journey away. And I, I never watched any first-class cricket. So I said, no, why is it, you know, is it worthwhile? And he said, well, his brother, um, Richard Sladin, who played for Derbyshire, he's a left-arm spinner. Um, he said, look, we could get you down to Derbyshire and, um, you know, you have a trial down there. I thought, oh, great, you know, it's a bit of an eye-opener. Yeah. And to be honest, at the age of 18, you know, I could bowl, but I didn't know really what I was doing with it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So I went down there. Um, yes, I, I did all right. I actually ended up having a... Um, I played at um, Gore Court in Kent for Derbyshire against Kent, which was my first ever second team game. Um, and I was, I was so far out of my depth at that point because I hadn't played enough real proper competitive cricket. Yeah. I had joined Halifax in the Yorkshire League and I was still learning my trade. So throughout those years of three years at university, I was still learning my trade as a bowler. Mm. And it was a great standard back then. They always had an overseas player or two playing, um, some great names. I remember playing against Paul Jarvis, who was still playing for Yorkshire at the time. Um, Darren Goff played for Barnsley. So you come across these these good cricketers and you, 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 coming from outside of a cricketing environment in Norfolk, you then start to learn and understand what first-class cricket's about. And so over those three years, learned a lot. Um, ended up going for trials at uh, Middlesex, North Ants, Lancashire, where David Lloyd, I think I've still got the letter up in the loft saying, sorry, we can't offer you any cricket here at Lancashire. 
So I have I have mentioned it to him in the past. <laughs> what might have been? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I could have had six hundred test wickets like Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. But um, um, so I actually thought my time of you know getting to play first class cricket was coming to an end because I'd gone back to Kings Lynn, where I was from, and I was working for the civil service. Um, I was set up as a then as a self-employed architectural technician. I was still playing competitive cricket um, in the Norfolk League, played a few games for Norfolk, but I, I luckily got um, invited to play for the full minor county side in 1996 um, in the Benson Hedges Cup against, um, it was in a, a, a round robin tournament in a league format. And so we played against um, Warwickshire, Leicestershire and Durham being one of those sides that we played against. Um, that was our last game and I bowled really well against uh, Sherwin Campbell, Mickey Rosebury, um, John Morris, who was playing at the time. Mm. And it was John Morris who actually said to Durham, you need to have another look at this guy, which they subsequently did and played a few second team games. And in the middle of the season, I think it was June, July, they offered me a contract for two years. And so I joined them there and then, and um, you know, <laughs> sort of got the opportunity that I wasn't expecting at the age of 24, which again was very late. Uh, yeah, it, it is when you like you say you, you compare nowadays to sort of people who are almost in the club already, aren't they? Through the academy system and things like that, it, it, you certainly don't see many stories uh, like that at the minute. And do you think we, we've seen it, for example, from one of Lancashire's players, say Richard Gleeson? You know that. Yeah, his, his I was just going to mention him myself. Story. Do you think there are other bowlers out there like yourself and like Richard Gleeson who perhaps are being missed and have gone under the radar? By definitely. Absolutely, definitely, because some don't come of age until later on, and you know that, that they grow, they develop, you know, physically later on than others. Yeah. Um, when I was eighteen, I was still, you know, five foot eight or five foot nine. I was such a late developer. So there's there's always an opportunity if you've got that natural ability and you're willing to learn and put in the hard yards then there's still opportunity out there when you're certainly a lot older than when you think you've passed it, as it were. But there's definitely people out there that can still do it at 24, 25. So we move on two years to 1998 and you, you moved to Kent. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to know how, how do these um, moves in, in cricket come about? You know, it's not like uh, in football where we hear of, you know, super agents being involved and getting yeah. deep on transfer deadline day. How, how, how do these <laughs> transfers come about in Kansas Cricket? Well, I promise you there was no multi-million pound deal last year. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise my backdrop would be a, a, a sun, sunset beach and uh, <laughs> it would be a lot better. Um, well, I mean, going back to my time at Durham, I, I got to the point of getting the contract and I was there a couple of years, but it was almost, I, I'd worked so hard to get there. I took my foot off the pedal. Mm. So the time at Durham, I probably didn't do myself justice. I didn't work hard enough. I didn't go to the gym. I didn't get fit. I didn't, I wasn't strong enough. So there was, there was far too many injuries. So I actually, I, I did get released from Durham. Um, very low point. Um, having worked so hard and then not quite done enough to stay there. So I got released in, um, it was in 98. Uh, the end of the season in 98. Um, but they said, they said to me, look, you can either, you know, pack your bags and head back to Norfolk or stick around until the end of the season. Because they told me in August, I think it was, and I said, look, I'll, I'll stick around. Because I didn't want to just, you know, that could be my last opportunity to play any cricket. Yeah. And I, I got quite lucky because I was playing in a second team game for Durham, actually the day that I got told I was being released against Surrey. Um, down in Oxford, I think it was, uh, in Surrey. And I bowled really well against the Surrey um, batters. And the umpire at the time was Mark Benson, who was still going through his sort of early stages of umpiring and doing a second team game there. And I, I said to him, oh, he, he said, well bowled today, it was brilliant. And I said, yeah, I've just been told I've been released. And he said, really? He said, well, Kent are looking for bowlers, so give me your number and I'll see what I can do. So he passed my number on to John Wright, who was um, coach at the time. And because I stayed on with Durham for the rest of the season, 
Luckily for me, there was a couple of injuries, and I ended up playing the last two matches of the season. One of them being against Worcestershire at New Road, and Kent were playing at Birmingham at the time. So John Wright drove down and wanted to have a look at me bowl. And I bowled quite well on the day, and I think I got three wickets in, in each innings. And they said, look, look, I liked what I saw, you know, let's stay in touch over the winter. Um, I went off to South Africa again, which I did most winters, to play a bit of uh, club cricket, which really did help me progress my bowling because you had to lead the attack. Yeah. And then the following summer, they then again had a couple of injuries at Kent. Um, it was when Dean Headley um, had a double stress fracture. Julian Thompson, his knee was suffering. So I ended up um, sort of getting a contract with Kent. I mean, it was literally a last ditch um, contract just for the summer. I mean, the money was, you know, literally nothing. But it didn't matter. It was a second chance. And I was 27 years old at the time. So I just, I just obviously grabbed it. And as I say, the, the rest is history, really. Very much. I mean, just looking at the, um, you know, the stats for that sort of that that, pe that period of 2000 to 2003, more than 50 first class wickets in each of those years yeah. is is yeah. some achievement. And I'd, I'd be interested to know what you found the key was for getting that consistency. Was it the fact, as you say, it was a it was a second chance, or did something just click? And you know. Have you got any advice for us mere club bowlers on, on how you're able to be so consistent in taking wickets, please? Um, I think for me, it's all about rhythm. Um, like I say, you know, I'm not a, a fast bowler by any means. Yes, I could, I could bowl sort of 85 and get it up to 90 mile an hour, but that wasn't my skill. My skill was line and length and swing it away. And the more you do that, the more you're going to give yourself the opportunity to get those edges or or just subtle variations, which I learned over the years, just to nip it back, you know, swing it away and nip it back because you've released it at, at, at a slight different angle. So you've hit the inside of the seam yeah. rather than the outside of the seam. Um, and I think it's just because it was a second chance, I certainly worked a lot harder in the gym, you know, got myself a lot fitter, stronger and kept myself on the park. Um, because you, you can't be doing anything when you're injured and obviously learn that at Durham. And I knew I had the ability to get wickets because when I did bowl for Durham, I, I actually did okay. So if I kept myself on the park, I knew I was always going to be in with a shout of getting wickets. And yeah, that's, I, I, you can't call it luck, but it's, it's and uh, Rob Key said to me, um, it's just about being boring. Just, just, just yeah. keep, keep getting in the same spot. If you get it in the same spot, that's the last thing the batsmen want. They don't, they, they want that release ball, that, that long hop. So just, just don't think about it too much as a bowler. There's too many bowlers that overcomplicate. They, they try and get the batsman out rather yeah. than just do your, what you're good at, what you're strong at, and just bowl line and length, hit the top of off. It's a cliche. We, we had a team meeting once where we went through the batting list. What do we do to this guy? Well, you you know, you just do it here. You pitch it here. You just hit the top of off. Next batsman, what do you do here? Oh, you just hit the top of off. If you hit the top of off, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you're making so much life so much easier for yourself and for the captain. He can, yeah. he can set a field for you. So that's the key for me. It's just, it's so basic. Just hit the top of off. And presumably that must be one of the biggest differences between professional and club cricket it's that consistency you know we, we yeah. see it on, on the field ourselves you know we can possibly get that ball on hitting the top of off maybe once every 10 12 balls whereas you know that's clearly not going to be good enough you know in, in the professional game absolutely and i think like i said earlier it's, it's about trying too hard it's just yeah. finding that rhythm where you can hit the top of off and it's so easy as well when you go to a, a practice session in the nets. You're bowling in the nets. The batsmen love to play shots. So it actually doesn't allow you to, to, to bowl that line of length because you get in a competitive situation. And as a bowler, yeah, you just want to bowl him a bouncer and knock his block off. <laughs> so you've almost got to take yourself away from that and just go out to the, to the middle and have 20 minutes of literally just bowling. Put down a, I used to put down a, a bit of carpet 
which was yeah. only you know one foot by one foot because if you hit that bit of carpet every time you, you're in the right area and mm. that's going to hit the top of half you put it you know you you might have to adjust your length depending on the pitch obviously if, it, if it's a harder pitch you can you can perhaps pitch it up a bit more if it's softer you just have to bring it a little bit you know there's subtle variations in the length you have to bowl but um yeah it's it's if you complicate things it's going to be more complicated for everyone else on the field that's it's quite interesting martin actually because uh, with my kids playing as well and i see it with their teammates and, and they want to get a, a wicket every ball and my son's 15 as well and and they We've had some some bowlers at our club, and there was one in particular, a guy called Mohammed Gayas, and he's a he's a club legend. Is 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 Gaza, and he was exactly he was he was so good at just hitting line and length every ball, and I just wish some of the you know the the juniors now could look at what Gaza used to do, and just he didn't care whether he got a wicket every ball. He just knew that eventually he would make the batsman make a mistake by Absolutely. his consistency, and um, yeah, I mean, it's. Like you say, they'll work it out eventually because they are only, you know, 15, 16 at the moment. But, yeah, the, the number of juniors that I have to have discussions with. And, and, and Dave will say, you know, when even when our bowlers are bowling, I, I, don't change. You know, if it's working, don't change. You don't have Absolutely. to Absolutely. different. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, but, yeah, it's, uh, certainly the juniors, they'll work it out eventually. We're absolutely <laughs> certain of that. Um, you hope. We, yeah. we try, yeah. yeah. Very, very, yeah, do try. Um, at the minute, we're, we're, we're talking in, in early November and the IPL's on at the minute. Um, you, of course, played in the first few years of the T20 Cup, as it was. Um, yeah. When you played in, in, in that Cup, obviously, it, you know, when it started, I remember it being sort of a bit a bit less serious, shall we say. Did you think at the time it would become sort of the, you know, the very serious, very, you know, rich phenomenon that it's become? I don't think any of us did. We we honestly saw it as a hit and a giggle, something that the ECB have just dreamt up, you know, something different um, for, for professional cricket. Because yeah. we all used to play 20 over cricket in the yeah. evenings, you know, starting at 5.30, 6 o'clock, you know, after a day's work or something, you head down and play a game of 20 over cricket. So it wasn't taken very seriously to start with. And the, true story... The first season it, it came in, we had Andrew Simons um, as our overseas player. You know, fairly uh, destructive batsman. So yeah. the club decided, right, we've got Dave Fulton as captain, club captain. Um, we're going to give the T. Dave Fulton was not a 2020 cricketer. He realised that. He said, right, Andrew Simons, you've got the rule of the roost for the whole of the T20 competition. Whatever you want goes. So we turned up at um, Maidstone for our first ever game. It was against Nottinghamshire, I believe. And true enough, he was the captain. We were all out in the middle. We were all doing our own little warm-ups, practising. And Ed Smith was hitting up his his usual half volley. So, you know, just one more half volley, please. Just another half volley. It's just there. No, no, it's a bit short, a bit fuller. And Andrew Simons just came out of the dressing room, walked straight up to Ed Smith, and he said, Ed, you're not fucking playing. <laughs> turned away and just carried on walking. Ed Smith turned around, uh, 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 and can we have a meeting, meeting, please, in, in the changing room now? <laughs> and it was just the start of, you know, quite quite a good day. But um, a lot of um, interesting sort of chats from Andrew Simons as captain. No. But that's, you know, we did play hard, but we didn't know how to play the game then. Yeah. Because it was so new. And the way that the guys play it now is just, you know, these reverse laps and, you know, this is where I think line of length does perhaps go out the window. Mm. One of my um, early games was I actually went on loan to Essex in 2007 and played most of my games for Essex. And we played against Surrey at uh, Chelmsford. And I opened the bowling. Ram Prakash was down the other end. Uh, my first delivery, just back of a length, swinging away, nipping away, through to James Foster. Took it, obviously, you know, high above his head. It was obviously still going. It was still, you know, it must have been 95 mile an hour, that delivery. <laughs> Second delivery, exactly the same, swinging away, nip away, off the seam, and uh, straight through to James Foster. And I thought, oh, this is all right. It's swinging a bit here. And I thought, yeah, I've got, I've, 
Round for cash, is he? <laughs> Next ball. I, I didn't do anything different. Line of late, same spot. What did he do? He came charging down the wicket, round for cash, and he has smashed me over the North Sea to Denmark. <laughs> um, it's, and that was probably the start of how they started that year was how they started to play their shots. Yeah. And, you know, you think, oh, hang on, I should have bowled him something different then. But that's what they do now. They, yeah. they, I know people say, oh, why have you bowled that? But you cannot bowl two balls the same in a row, I don't think, unless you can nail your Yorkers like um, Bumrah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which... Far. Do you think it's gone too far that way towards sort of favouring the batsmen? Does it need to be brought back a bit to keep bowlers... In the game. No, I, I don't actually. People say that, you know, mm. we want to see fours and sixes. Yeah. And I think a good bowler, and it's a good challenge for a bowler to stop that batter from hitting fours and sixes. The spinners were were, were trying a, a, a number of years ago now. I think Graham Swan was trying it to bowl, not a double bouncer, obviously, because that would be mm. a no ball. But to get the second bounce that would bounce just beyond the popping crease. Yeah. So there's no pace on the ball. Um, or they were actually, sorry, the law changed because of that. They were, they were actually trying to get the second bounce just, just in front of the batter with no pace whatsoever. So that they couldn't, you know, get power into the shot. Um, so it's, it's for the bowlers to, to change things. There's so many different slower balls that they bowl now. The skill level of these bowlers. And I've mentioned Boomer, you know, the Yorkers is, is, you cannot go away from, if you can get a good Yorker in there, um, yeah. unless you've got a batsman down that, no, you can, not all batsmen can play like Joss Butler and just, and Owen Morgan that can sweep, you know, 85 mile an hour Yorkers. So if you can get a good Yorker in there, that's one of the first deliveries you've got to practice as a, as a bowler if you're not practicing line and length, I believe. Mm. Very much. Um, so, throughout all your time with uh, the, the various counties that you've played for, who would you say are the best players that you've played with and against during your time? Um, I've been so fortunate. Um, I, I, I'll never forget when I finished um, university in 1993, the Australians were over. And it was the year that, I think it was the year, that was it that year or the previous tour, 89, where Steve War was, he averaged 260 or 280 or something, you know, man of the series. And he, he was just a, a great batsman to watch. Um, he, he joined Kent for six weeks, controversially, just before another Ashes series to get some practice in. Yeah. But to play alongside him and see the professionalism and the amount of training he put in, you know, and I've got a lovely picture at home where I've got a wicket where it's court war, bold saggers. You know, and that for me was a highlight to have seen somebody before I'd even set out on my first class career um, to then play alongside him yeah. and be involved in a, in a, in a game with him. Um, I've mentioned Andrew Simons. We had Muralitharan with us. I mean, he, he turned, turned games so quickly. Um, yes, there's lots of talk about his action, but at the end of the day, the skill levels he had yeah. um, to, to get that ball to do what it did, you know, and to bowl such different paces, subtle changes. Um, Raul Dravid um, played with him yeah. uh, for a season at, at, at Kent. But playing, playing against, um, Darren Lehman is such a, a tough component to bowl at. And when you get him out, you know you've got your wicket. Um, our first ever floodlit game, it was the, the talk was we have to get Darren Lehman out. Unfortunately, we, you know, I got, I got him out, I think, third ball for one. And it was just, we, we knew then that we had a chance of winning the game. If, it, if he'd have stayed in, that was, there was yeah. no chance. Um, so little, little things like that you do remember um, when you have such big names playing in the, in the game against you or for you. Yeah, they're not some bad names at all. <laughs> so, obviously, one thing we have to touch on is the the three tests that you played for England. You know, one of those one of those lucky individuals who plays the sport who goes on to you know international honours. Um, it must have been quite a feeling making your debut for England in, in in Dakar. It must have been quite something. It's such a journey that you've been on. <laughs> well, more of a journey than you think, actually. Um, <laughs> closer to the time but yeah you know having 
as we talked about, starting off playing village cricket, I, I, at, at one point I didn't even think I was going to play first class cricket, let alone move on and play for England. You know, it, it, it literally was, you know, a boyhood dream. Um, people coming from Norfolk, not many people make it, you know, from Norfolk. Well, not people, not many people escape from Norfolk, to be honest. <laughs> I, was one, I, was, I was one of the lucky ones. But um, when I, as I said earlier, um, I, I often go out to South Africa to play cricket in the winter. So it was um, end of September, season had finished in 2003. And I went out to South Africa, had it all planned with my usual club. Went out on the fr- uh, Thursday, arrived on the Friday, played cricket on the Saturday, played cricket on the Sunday. Um, and then Monday morning, I thought, right, now I can get myself organised. I'm at my mate's place. Um, let me just let, let me just chill out. I'll have a coffee. And I got this phone call from uh, David Gravely. He said, uh, Martin, just, just wanted to find out what your availability is for... Um, for, for going to Bangladesh to replace Andrew Flintoff. And I thought, hang on, I can't bat. I'm not going <laughs> around. You've got the wrong number. Um, but now I, I said, uh, yes, I'm, I'm available, obviously. So he said, look, give me, give me 20 minutes. I uh, just need to chat over. It's, it's between you and a couple of others, and we'll let you know. So, yeah, okay, so I'm hanging on the phone. That must have been and, quite a 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, true enough, 20 minutes later, you know, he, he said, look, we want you to come over. You know, when can you get over? Uh, Ber- this was the Monday, and England were flying out on the Wednesday. So I said, look, I can, I can fly out tonight, which I did. I flew out the Monday night, got back on the Tuesday morning, didn't have anything organised, so I went back to... Um, um, or were they? Sorry, they were flying out on the Tuesday, I think. So I flew home on the, the got got back on the Tuesday morning, went and met the rest of the, the the team that were flying out just to get some kit. Went back home for an evening, and then flew out on the Wednesday. So it was a bit of a whirlwind sort of trip. Ended up in Bangladesh, obviously, um, for the tour. Um, great experience you know to go abroad to a, a you know a, a country i've never been to before the humidity that i remember the most the, the the heat was just immense um but just the experience of being with the england team and to be honest i, I, I never thought i'd play in the matches because it was only a, a two test series um and that you know to harmison hoggard um obviously i'd replace flintoff um Johnson was out there, Ricky Clark. So I was I was last cab on the rank, as it were. But um, in the second test, uh, it was the day before the second test. I was just bowling to all the batsmen in the in the middle and in the nets. You know, not thinking too much about it because I knew I wasn't playing. Yeah. And Duncan Fletcher then came up to me and said, uh, "Sags, you know, just perhaps just take a breather because uh, Harmison's gone in the back." Um, I think it was the back, or was it homesick? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> it, it was definitely, uh, definitely the back. Um, 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 so he, he said, you might be playing tomorrow. So I, I stopped then and then, you know, got to the meeting that night and Harmson was heading home. And I was told then that evening that I was making my debut the next day, which was, you know, something you do strive for, obviously. Um, and it was, you know, it perhaps didn't go as well as I'd hoped. But um, it was still a great experience. Um, there was one session where I, I, I got a run out, I got a wicket, and I took a, a one-handed catch sort of over my head, which finished the session off and led led the team off um, in front of the you know a, a packed house of 250 Bangladeshis. <laughs> and it, it was you know it was it was a great experience you know to just be on a tour with England and you're playing along. Vaughan was captain. Um, Hussain had just given up the captaincy, um, so it was it was, it was a, a great trip, and I learned so much on that trip. What did you find? We, we spoke about the difference uh, that you found between club and county cricket. Um, what did you find? Was there any difference between county and international level? Was the gap between the two as big as county and, and club cricket? Certainly, in that test against Bangladesh, no. Um, because Bangladesh were a new uh, country at the time, mm. just making their way in the test arena. So 
you know, they, 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 they were they were the, one of the minnows, and probably they still are. Um, but they're a lot more competitive than they used to be. Yeah. Then. It was only really you know, when you come back to the UK and I played a couple of tests the following summer, you just realise the intensities a little bit more. The the, um, the lack of um, amount of error you can give as a bowler. You know, any any slight variance in in length or or width is punished by the batters. You know, you got um, Stephen Fleming. You know, he, he, he picked up the length so much quicker. So you have to be even more consistent with your yeah. line and length there. Um, so and you've got the crowd there as well. You know, you're playing in front of 20,000 people. And yeah, yes, you you don't necessarily notice it when you're running into bowl. But it's still there. It's still yeah. the buzz, and mm. it, it's it's you, you are. If if you don't perform, you know it is much more noticeable. Yeah. Do you think um, if you played in the current era, um, it would have been different? Would you have perhaps played one day cricket, T Twenty cricket, or do you think you're always destined for the Test? Um, I think my, my type of bowling was probably more. Test. I, mm. I enjoyed the the four day cricket more than the one day cricket, and I th I think my type of bowling, you know, because I was consistent, it was probably more suited to you know red ball cricket, you yeah. know, um, traditional cricket as it were, mm. and I think it, it's probably the highest accolade to play Test cricket as well. Mm. Um, yeah. There's a lot of players out there that have played. You know, their careers are basically T20. Yes, they've earned a lot of money over that time and probably still are. But I, I still see that England cap as a test cap being the, the pinnacle and the ultimate, you know, goal that, that players want to play for. Yeah, and I, I still have the test cap, presumably. Yeah, I certainly have, yeah. <laughs> Got it, you know, you do get a, a, an embroidered... Um, test cap, you know, saying your first um, match as well as your playing cap as well. And yes, they're they're well and truly mounted and you know up on the wall back home in Kent. The, just just going to touch on what you said, something you said there, Martin, in terms of you know the test being the pinnacle. Um, I got into a little bit, I won't say an argument with Kevin Peterson on Twitter, but I responded to something he said in terms of um, how T20 was you know ruling the roost now. And, and I, I just, it, it still does surprise me though, the amount that younger cricketers coming up now still do aspire to test cricket. I don't think, whilst T20 does, you know, don't, don't get me wrong, it is everywhere and it is so prevalent in, in current cricket. I still do think, I think if you took a little poll of, of junior cricketers from say 11 to, to 16, I think that the, most would still see test cricket as, I might be speaking out of turn until you ask those cricketers, but they do still see Test cricket as, like you say, the pinnacle of certainly international cricket. I don't think anybody sees that T20 has overtaken it from a, um, you know, people seeing it as as as, as the peak really, as a status. Exactly. I think I think T20 is what keeps the whole game running financially um i think i think it's just proven i mean yes we've got test cricket on and we want to see test cricket but the t20 cricket is which which is what all the you know the, the tv companies want to buy because yeah. it's it's short and sharp um so that's that's the, and you can sell it to all these countries whereas test cricket i don't think you can sell so so much unless yeah. it's a massive series if it's australia england you know, or South Africa or India. Yes, you can sell it, but if you've got Zimbabwe versus Bangladesh, Sky are not going to buy that. They're not going to put that on the TV. The IPL, they want to put that on. You've got the big names. You've got big hitters. You've got close finishes. How many how many games are going into, um, you know, in, in, into a super over now? Yeah. And and it's it's a great spectacle. And that's what's bringing in the revenue, which is funding... A majority of the cricket yeah. and you know we've got the 100 ball that's hopefully going to start again this summer um obviously with the issues we've had this summer we weren't able to to go through with it but um i think the 100 ball is going to be going to be a change because it's, gonna, it's time time wise it's going to be shorter and more condensed yeah. and it's going to be on bbc as well i believe 
Mm. Yeah, all, all being well next year, obviously. Lockdown permitting. Um, yeah. And vaccines, um, hope. Yeah. Um, I'll hand over to Neil now for some um, questions on sort of the next stage of your cricketing journey and moving off the field, but then back onto the field, I suppose. I think Dave's handing this over to me because I've had my history with umpires, Martin, and then oh, really? oh, and right, then okay. sort of moving into bit. umpiring myself, um, doing a bit of our Sunday team and stuff like that. So it, it does strike more of a chord with me. I've just done my uh, my le online level one during lockdown as well. So I am trying to take it a little bit more seriously now and understanding an umpire's perspective. But I'm hoping you'll help me understanding a little bit more with these questions. So, Well, um, as long as I don't have to end up giving the issue you a level one or a level two. <laughs> it's been close. It's been yeah. close. <laughs> Might have been a few years ago. I'm, I'm mellowing a little bit now. Um, first of all, was umpiring while you were playing something that you'd thought of? Is it something that you always wanted to do? <laughs> Well, no, I, it, it wasn't. I mean, as I said before, I, I, I studied architecture. So I had that degree sort of, you know, behind me before I moved into cricket. So I didn't think of life after cricket um, whilst I was playing at the time, you know, early days. Um, but I could have always gone into architecture afterwards. Mm -hmm. It was only when I was playing sort of around... 2003 2004 you know I was already sort of 31 32 then so even though I was fairly sort of new to my career you know new to doing well in cricket I still had to think about what was going to happen you know when I was sort of finishing my career and I, I was talking to Jeremy Lloyd's out in the middle and you know he, he said have you ever thought about umpiring I said no I haven't actually but you know what, what is it about umpiring? What appeals to you? And um, so I sort of continued the conversation with him, and it was something I thought I'm gonna, you know, follow that avenue and, and see where it takes me. Yeah. So I did level one back in 2004, I think it was, and I ended up level three. I did in 2007, and got in touch with the ECB and Chris Kelly, who runs the. the the umpiring fraternity and he said look just let me know when you're going to finish playing and we'll get you on the reserve list sort of thing yeah. so I, I had a I, I was very lucky and um, they were looking for ex-players to move in and so I got a bit of a, a quick path within moving into the umpiring world so yes I was I was certainly onto it whilst I was playing which is something the PCA you know they've done a lot for current players and life after cricket you know and and their future and what they're going to do that that was something that i was going to touch on actually that we're, we're now seeing with the current crop and, and your, your colleagues certainly you've done a lot of the umpiring this summer a lot of ex-players um of a similar age to yourself and and it, it, it clearly must have been a message from pca and, and the umpires association at the time to you know try and get your talent as, as ex-players and feeling that was a, a big plus for turning you into umpires? I think it's it, what it boils down to. I think the ECB have, have sort of seen that ex-players have made good umpires mm -hmm. because everyone can learn the laws, but not everyone can learn the first-class game. Yeah. Because playing first-class cricket is totally different than, you know, club cricket. And it's understanding the way these first-class cricketers go about their daily business. And they, you know, they're always trying to get one one up on the umpire or, you know, they're always trying to bend the rules, the laws, sorry. And it's it's knowing the game. And I think that's what's helped. And yeah. we, we have seen, you know, some umpires that, that, that have struggled, that haven't played the game. So look, it doesn't mean they're not going to be good umpires because we've had... Simon Torfel, who didn't play first class cricket, he played high, you know, grade cricket in Australia. Um, so they, they, you know, they still make good umpires, but it's understanding the way the players think and almost seeing what could happen the next delivery or yeah. in, in an over's time. You see those two players that are just, just having a little bit of a tussle, but they haven't said anything, but you can see it's just building. Yeah. And maybe, you know, stepping in before something happens. Yeah, absolutely. It must be must be absolutely vital experience from that point of view. Sort of touching on that then, 
in your early days as an umpire, were there any situations where you were umpiring players that you'd played with or against before? And how oh, yeah. how did you handle yeah. that? How how did that progress? Well, it still happens. I mean, Darren Stevens is going to still be playing for another twenty years. I <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's actually true. his playing career is going to outlive my umpiring. Career. <laughs> so, yeah, you're always there's still plenty of players out there I've played with. I mean, Jimmy, I've, I've played with Jimmy, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you do get to understand these individuals, um, and just you just got to work with them and yeah. just you know understand them and that they're trying to win. So it's there are difficult characters out there and you've just got to be able to manage them. Just progressing from your, your county umpiring into international, how, again, how does that come about? How does that progression happen? And, uh, and what sort of differences have you seen in that? Um, well, I think it's like in, in every work environment, you've got to work your way up the ladder. Um, you've got to... Um, Almost have clean games and do make good decisions. Uh, look, every umpire is going to make an error. Yeah. Um, it's we don't like to call them mistakes because we don't want to purposefully get get something wrong. Um, you just make errors in judgment. You don't quite see it correctly. When you look at the replay, you think, "Oh my word, how have I given that out?" Um, a prime example was the second delivery. England versus Australia, Mitchell Stark to Jason Roy. And I, I had it, the impact, as on the knee roll. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was going a little bit lower, but it had bounced higher. Newer ball, it's going to bounce higher. And as soon as I saw the first replay, I thought, how have I given that out? So it's luckily for us now, they do have the replay system. So mm -hmm. you don't have that. If, if, if obviously that wasn't there, Jason Roy would have you know, been unhappy with the decision. And you know, obviously, he would show his his disgust and probably quite rightly, but because the, the correct decision was then made, it it kind of you forget about the fact that it was given wrong in the first place. Yeah. But it is it, it's something you have to deal with as an umpire that you can make errors. Yeah, and 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 something as club umpires we do probably more, more often than not in all honesty it's probably quite this is the flip side more wrong than right but we'll come on to that in a moment in terms of club umpires one thing that um we often see you guys doing on the field um is being very visual when there's rain breaks is there anything other than inspecting and keeping in touch with the ground staff are they the most things that you have to do during a rain break uh, calculations. If you've got a, um, you know, a T20, yeah, championship cricket's not that much, not not too difficult. But if you've got a rain break in a T20 match, um, if it happens in the first innings, there's a lot of calculations you have mm -hmm. to do. So you, you literally go in and you plan ahead because you don't know how long that rain's going to happen. It could be ten minutes, so you could be starting in ten minutes' time. Yes, you might have a, you know, half an hour to play with, you know, as extra time, but. Yeah you could be back on the park in 10 minutes. So you've got to, you've got to be able to go to the captain and say, right, it's been reduced to an 18 over a side match, you know, and the power play is down to 5.4 or whatever it is. Um, you've got to have that information to hand straight away. So you do all that straight away. As soon as you get off the pitch, yeah. whilst it's raining, before you go out and inspect, you, you do five minute slots so that you know at quarter past two, it's going to be an 18 over match. At 20 past two, it's going to be a 17 over match. And you just work, work, keep on working through the time yeah. until you come to a point where it's only going to be a five over match. And then you say, guys, right, see you in the bar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Game off. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the point we all know and love in club cricket. Yeah, that point where you're just looking at, it's not going to be fit, guys. Come on, off we go. That's it. Job done. Um just going back to what we were just discussing before, that question in terms of club cricket and, and umpiring in club cricket. If, as, as a professional umpire now, if there was a couple of tips that you could give for a club umpire, somebody that's going to do the Sunday team, not potentially on a panel because those guys are doing their um, their courses and have done their courses, yeah. but you know, somebody who is just a lover of the game, who's helping out on a Sunday what are the tips that you could give that person to concentrate during that game? Um, it's, it's, it, it all happens before the game, before the toss. When the, um, the umpires should get
get to the ground, you know, an hour, hour and a half before the match starts. The last thing you want as teams is, a, is an umpire turning up, 15 minutes to go. Oh, sorry, guys, let's do the toss quickly, you know, do the toss and straight on. If I was doing a club game, I would still treat it like um, a, a, a professional game because all those players expect the best from the umpires. So if I was a club umpire, I would get, get out there half an hour before the toss and be, be visual, be yeah. there, so that the players can come and talk to you if they want. You know, you can talk to the players. I think it's important to speak to the captains before the toss, as in a half an hour before, you know, find out who the captains are if you've never met them before, so you get to know them and they get to know you so that they, they realise that you're not just there to make the out or not out decision. You're there because you enjoy the day. Yeah. Because all those umpires that are there, they, they enjoy umpiring and they enjoy cricket and they, they don't want the abuse. So make it easier on yourself as an umpire by getting there early and being you know, managing the situation before the games even started. So you've yeah. managed the players. You know, if, if there's a, a, a difficult player, find out who that difficult player is. You know, if, if you've been difficult in the past, the umpire should know that. So he yeah. could come up to you and chat to you before the game and have a laugh with you, have a bit of yeah. banter. Because that's what club cricket's about as well, is having some banter. And getting to know the players and, and, and managing the whole day, not just the game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for us, at our level, we, we play at a second team level, me and Dave, and we have club umpires. We have our own club umpire, and, and, and Jim is, is brilliant in terms of um, his enthusiasm for the game. So that, that's yeah. fine. Uh, we, we managed to get through to our cup final this year and win it. And, and I've got to say, the two umpires on the day were two of our panel umpires did exactly that. They were down early. They were discussing with both teams. They were obviously checking the COVID precautions as well this year yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and 100% those guys were absolutely superb and for us as people who don't normally have panel umpires it was an absolute joy to have guys managing and it was it was exactly that it was managing the day yeah. and uh, and yeah it was it was uh, it makes a big difference you're setting does. the scene you're setting and it, it makes makes you feel more relaxed that you haven't got two officious you know guys at either end that all they're going to do is is make decisions and then say yes no you're out you're not out yeah you know yeah no hundred percent they it, it really did that it, it it made the day even more special because they were uh, they were very good at what they did so yeah it was hundred percent I, I would I would also take that the other way as well I think it's important that the players don't see the umpires as just officials yes yeah the players have to make a a point of you know when they're warming up. You know, say hello to the umpires, have a chat with the umpires, you know, because I, it, it may or may not help the decision making in the future. <laughs> but, you know, when you want that 50-50 to go your way, but certainly it won't help you if you come across, you know, badly towards yeah. it at the start of the day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's something we try and encourage and, and just to be, even if it's a club umpire, you know. You, you don't know if that guy's going to be good or bad at the start of the inning. So, no. you know, always, always good to, you know, a little bit of respect is there for a reason. We, we, and we keep saying it, without umpires, there's no Absolutely. game. So, so yeah, 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 100%. Right, so that that's your umpiring. Thanks very much for that, Martin. Really, <laughs> really interesting to get an insight because it's something that we discuss a lot in our team in terms of umpiring and, and, and the progressions and stuff like that. So it's really... That was that was really good to get that perspective. We're going to move I on. I think to... just can I just sorry just yeah, following on from that as well. It's one of those things that as a, as a batter, you know, the, the amount of times you do get given out and you know you're not out, or it it is a, a an umpire's sort of bugbear that you know they show dissent. The umpire's not going to change his mind, no. or they probably you know ninety nine point nine percent of the time won't change their mind just you have to accept the decision because once you start talking about it between the opposition at the end of the day everyone will realize your team included that it was the wrong decision mm. and it won't go against you then but if you act up whilst you're walking off it's going to go against you as a batter and it's one of yeah. the worst things for us as an umpire to see and we have to then issue a level one or whatever we don't like doing it yeah so we we do encourage people and we say at the toss regardless of the decision 
whether it's out, not out, a wide, not a wide, a no ball, for head height or not, we're not going to change our decision. So please accept it and move on with the game. Yeah. And if, if, if everybody does that, I think the game will be played a lot easier and a lot, yeah. lot, lot nicer, I think, as well. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Well, now we're going to move on to our usual, what we would normally call Tales from the Dale. And this is... Quick fire round. Quick fire round, <laughs> playing an umpiring edition. Um, your answers can come from either your playing career or your umpiring career. We don't mind which. You can throw anybody under the bus here. We are not <laughs> not gonna not gonna tell you what you can and can't say. So yeah. <laughs> so club cricket stereotypes. So first of all, who would be most likely to forget their subs? Um, probably Stuart Huffman. He um, a left-handed batter that played for Durham. One of the tightest men I've ever come across in cricket. He literally. Um, we 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 were we had club cars. And we were given petrol money um, for, for those that were driving. And if he was taking you home, he would ask for a fiver to drop you off at home. An extra <laughs> fiver. Because it's gone out of his way. Even though he can claim it off the club sort of thing. So, yeah, Stuart Hutton. <laughs> that's, absolutely, that's a great start. I like that one. Okay, who would be the next? Who would be the last, should I say, to arrive at the ground? Punctuality has gone out the window on this one. Who's that? That would definitely be Dave Fulton, my past captain and almost neighbour. He lives four doors down from me. Um, and he won't mind me saying this because he knows it. He would literally walk in last last minute, even though he's got to go out for the toss as well. No, maybe not that late, but he would turn and say, Sags, you haven't got a spare pair of trousers I could borrow <laughs> or, or, or a shirt or something. He would always be forgetting things and I would be the first person he comes, comes to to ask the new kit. <laughs> Sounds like plenty of our, our players that day, to be fair. Yeah, yeah we, we're, like we're lucky if we've got some cricket stereotypes, don't you? <laughs> yeah. mm. Right, this is a tricky one. And as I say, this was modelled on me. Which player or umpire would be most likely to fall out with an umpire or player? Hmm. <laughs> um... It's, it's, there's, 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 a, there's a, there was a, a former bowler, used to play for Nottinghamshire, then he moved to Leicestershire, um, called Charlie Shrek. Yeah. Uh, yes, I know, I know of Charlie. He yeah. played for Kent as well, as well actually. actually. Honestly, um, he's one of the most intelligent people you'll come across. Very good with computers and very intelligent. Um, and I've, I've had a meal with him um, in Cheltenham when I was I was umpiring and um, Leicester versus Gloucestershire and you know he invited me over had a meal with him had a great chat with him on the field as soon as he stepped over the mark over the line he it, if it wasn't going his way he would find an excuse to 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 find to, to have a go at the umpire or have a go at the non-striker. Everything was going against him when he was on the field of play. So I think, you know, having to deal with him as an umpire was probably the most, yeah, difficult. It's, it, don't, don't people always say that, though? The, these guys who are, who are you could, quite fiery are always the nicest guys off the field. Strange yeah. one, that. It's always the case. Yeah. Right. Who enjoys their lunch or tea break the most? <laughs> Let me think. As well, Matt Walker. Yeah, Matt Walker enjoys a. a, a I have to say, I mean, I enjoy eating too much. Um, <laughs> I always used to. Um, we always used to have um, lunch. This chef at Kent. Um, say we we had the the opposition sort of seven wickets down at lunch. I could never eat anything at lunch because I knew that I was perhaps bowling the first yeah. over, and if I ate too much, head rush get dizzy, can't bowl. So I used to get a plate full of food, main dish, put it to the side, and Daz used to do a, um, a treacle sponge pudding and custard mm. or a chocolate sponge pudding and oh, custard. Yes. And I used to just put it aside and say, Daz, just hold that for me. I'll be back in 20 minutes to finish that <laughs> off. That was my incentive to get the last three wickets. That, yeah. I like that. That's and yeah, true enough. Yeah, get changed, shorts on, down to the dining room and I used to tuck in. Yeah. yeah, I have to say, I do, I do enjoy it when uh, Neil wins, 
the one toss that he wins a season. <laughs> all in first for that exact reason, I can enjoy my tea and then put my feet. Get it up. out of the way. Yeah. Exactly. No, I'm batting down the order. I just you know, fill my boots. Absolutely. <laughs> I remember that one, Dave. You had to get a, a jibing about <laughs> losing tosses, but never mind. One, one uh, toss, one decade. One toss, one toss win. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who is the most likely to enjoy? I'll look forward to a rain break. <laughs> Mark Elam. Okay. Mark Elam absolutely loved it. Yeah, he was always, he was, every time he used to drive in in the mornings, we used to get into the dressing room and he used to say, guys, cows are sleeping. Cows are lying down. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was desperate. He was always looking up at the skies. Back then, we didn't have the apps that we've got now. Yeah. So he would have been, he would have about been out in the middle with his phone just looking at, uh, <laughs> Will it rain today? Just to see if the, the big blue blobs coming over. Yeah, he used to love getting off the field. Interesting. Interesting. I like that one. <laughs> right, last one. It's a good one. Who's most likely to be a cricket badger? Do you know what? Um, Matthias Muralitharan. He absolutely knew everything about everybody when he when he came to see us. Um, when he came to play play for us. Every time we played against somebody, he would say, oh, he's got so many wickets. He's done this. He's done that. He, he is a, I mean, you know, the, the, the cricket in Sri Lanka, he grew up with cricket. That's their, yeah. their main sport. And mm. everybody wanted to play it. And they all knew everybody in and out. Yeah. And I, I, he, he honestly knew everybody. So, um, yeah, I would, I would class him as a badger. And he would admit to it as well, I think. Well, I tell you what, say in, in the days now of, of play cricket and stats everywhere, I think uh, I'm going to say a lot of club cricketers are turning in. It's a conversation yeah. that we have on a, a Friday night before a Saturday. You know, what's the, what's the opposition done? Play cricket's made that so much easier for everybody to be a cricket badger now. And, Absolutely, uh, yeah. Level. So it's uh, ah, okay. So so Murley is a is a is a oh, stats man. Excellent. Definitely. Super. Well, that brings us to the end of our questions, Martin. As I say. Once again, we can only thank you for coming on. It's been a, an absolute pleasure picking your brain from both from a playing and an umpiring perspective. Um, what's what's the plans now over the winter for yourself? Anything? Obviously, lockdowns affecting things slightly, but is there anything in the pipeline? Uh, nothing cricket-wise this winter. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of DIY <laughs> going on around the house. Um, <laughs> Obviously, being in a bio bubble most of the summer, um, I haven't yeah. been able to do the chores around the house that I wanted to do. So, it, to be honest, it, it, it'd be nice. Um, just hopefully, we can all enjoy Christmas. You know, yeah. we won't be still in a lockdown, and we can just get on with you know enjoying winter and the Christmas festive period. Hopefully, we can start the season next year, you know, with a full season. Um, yeah. Who who knows? But um, yeah, just looking forward to the future. And, Hopefully a few more, you know, major matches and we'll see what happens, see what goes. Well, from us, best of luck with that and uh, and hope the DIY goes smoothly for you. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dave, thanks very much for joining us again. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Thank you very much, Martin. No problem. Thank you. And um, good luck to everyone uh, for next season. Thank you very much. And uh, you've been watching Up the Dale from Wantley Dale once again. Thanks, everybody, for watching and join us soon when we'll... We'll hopefully have more entertaining guests such as Martin. So thanks again for watching. We'll see you all again soon.